to this FIP webinar on green and sustainable pharmacy practice. Um, we welcome you all. And as an introduction, um, just a moment, I will just share my screen. Minor technical issue here, apologies. Okay, I think we're good to go. Okay, apologies for that. Uh, I think we have overcome this minor uh, technical issue. Um, my name is Gonzalo Sosa Pinto. I'm lead for practice development and transformation at FIP, the International Pharmaceutical Federation. And today's webinar will be dealing with uh, green pharmacy practice and the impact of pharmaceuticals on the environment. Um, just before we move on with the content of our webinar, uh, some uh, house rules and announcements. So uh, this webinar is being recorded and it's also being live streamed via Facebook. So, um, and the recording will be available on our website for FIP individual members. Uh, please use the Q&A box on, on, on your screen to ask questions. We will have a, a, a period at the, end, at the end of both presentations today uh, to uh, deal with some of your questions. So please do use that, um, the Q&A box for, for these questions uh, rather than the, the chat box that you have been encouraged to use while we were waiting for the webinar to start. Um, you're welcome also after the webinar to provide feedback uh, by email. If you have any other comments or suggestions for our webinar program, uh, you can write us to uh, webinars at fip.org. And we do invite you to, to look up the information on how to become an, an individual member of FIP and to check up the, check out the, the benefits of, of, for our individual membership. That includes access not only to uh, the library of webinars and publications, but to other resources and a whole network. Uh, of experts and colleagues around the world. Uh, so we will now start with a brief um, poll or a brief uh, quiz, let's say, uh, on the contents of the webinar that we will repeat at the end to assess somehow uh, the impact of this event, of this webinar, on your awareness, on your knowledge about the, the subject that we are discussing here today. So please uh, take a few seconds to respond to the questions that will pop up on your screen. APIs, uh, if you're not familiar with the acronym, are active pharmaceutical ingredients. I'm sure that as pharmacists you will know, but sometimes it's just to clarify. So this is three questions that will pop up. And the third question, and last. I know what I can do in my professional role as a pharmacist in terms of um, providing solutions and addressing the problems related to APIs entering the environment. Okay, thank you very much for participating. And so we will now continue just with a few, a few thoughts and remarks on for background, for context for this uh, webinar today. Um, in 2016, this is not a new subject for FIP. Uh, we have been dealing with it for a number of years. And in 2016, FIP adopted a statement of policy 
on the exact same topic of today's webinar, environmentally sustainable pharmacy practice, or in other words, what we've been calling green pharmacy practice. Um, the preamble of, of this policy statement reminds us that medicines, of course, are crucial tools to prevent or treat diseases, but there's also growing evidence that the residuals of pharmaceutical products can be found in the ecosystem, in water, in atmosphere or the soil, with possibly negative impacts for the environment, for health, for a number of the uh, species that uh, share our ecosystem with us. Uh, also, activities related to the research, the development, the production, distribution and dispensing of medicines may also have an impact on the environment, which is of course aggravated by globalization and by demographic change. And the world we know that is now going through a major health crisis um, due to COVID-19, but this should not uh, make us forget about the critical challenge of the environmental, environmental sustainability uh, and the world that we will be leaving for the future generations. So this is a challenge that for which uh, individual pharmacists, but also professional associations and organizations can provide leadership and make a difference, which is why we are now sharing this webinar with you as well. On the other hand, of course, it is imperative that our efforts to implement solutions do not compromise the availability of medicines um, and of course, patient access to these medicines because the, the needs of the patient still needs to be the, the top priority and of the utmost importance. But this, of course, should not prevent us from taking measures to protect the environment as well. Throughout the pharmaceutical supply chain, efforts can be made to mitigate the negative impact of pharmaceuticals and related activities on the environment. So with today's webinar, we aim to raise awareness and to promote a deeper understanding of this problem and to invite you as colleagues in different parts of the world to engage with the solutions that we as pharmacists and our professional as a whole can offer to these challenges. So before um, we move on with the presentations, just to give you a brief overview of today's webinar, so uh, an introduction which we've gone through, and then we will have two presentations. The first one by Jaco Tepo uh, will provide some a theoretical introduction for about 25 minutes of how APIs actually make their way to the environment and which kinds of molecules are the most dangerous or, uh, or more uh, present a higher risk and why, and highlight the particular case of antimicrobial resistance. Then we'll, we'll, these will be a sort of a more theoretical introduction, as I said, and then we will also analyze this problem from the practice side. So in terms of the solutions that pharmacists can set in place or put in place to actually address some of the problems that uh, Jaco will be describing. Um, so Eva will, will discuss the classification of APIs and present different solution models from across the whole range from production to distribution and dispensing uh, chain. And then, as I said, we will have about half an hour for questions from you. And, and then we will just wrap up and highlight some uh, key messages. Um, so the learning objectives of this webinar, uh, so if we, we expect or uh, we hope that uh, after this webinar you may uh, understand the mechanisms of how far active pharmaceutical ingredients enter uh, the environment, uh, understand what kind of problems that APIs cause for the environment, and also get some ideas uh, of models and solutions that pharmacists can uh, put in place to prevent these problems. I will now give the floor uh, to uh, Dr. Jako Teppo from Finland. Um, Jako studied pharmacy at, at the University of, of Helsinki, and he completed his doctoral dissertation in the field of pharmaceutical chemistry in early 2020. So this year, congratulations, Jako, by the way. Um, he became interested in green pharmacy and environmental effects of pharmaceuticals already during his studies and he has been active in the field via the Generation Green Initiative since 2014. In addition to academic work, uh, Jaco has been working part-time in various community pharmacies 
and thus staying up to date about pharmacy practice and also linking the theoretical aspects of his research to the practice of pharmacy in the community setting. So thank you very much, Jaco, for sharing your expertise and time with us. And the uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, now let's uh, just test that this uh, appears to be working. Uh, I can change slides. Yeah, uh, so uh, thank you for the kind in introduction as well as the uh, invitation to speak in this webinar uh, in the next 25 minutes or so, we'll be going through, as Hans mentioned, this uh, theoretical background uh, of pharma active pharmaceutical ingredients uh, in the environment. Um, the viewpoint will be rather chemical, uh, uh, partially due to my background, but nevertheless, the um, uh, examples will be more practical. Uh, now, why uh, we, are, we will focus on the uh, aquatic environment mainly due to because most of the effects take place there since that is the place uh, where the majority of uh, pharmaceuticals in the environment end up. Uh, I'll be going through uh, uh, just as an introduction or a reminder this uh, general properties of pharmaceuticals then we'll spend a couple of slides discussing flow of APIs in the nature and the residuals in the environment and also meta metabolism. I have a couple of slides of wastewater management, but that is mainly for the interested audience, so I will not be going through them in detail. And then some by no means comprehensive, but rather as an example type uh, introduction to where APIs have been found in the environment and what they uh, have been found uh, to do there. And finally, some uh, we'll discuss some ways how ecotoxicity is measured. Um, yeah, let's see where I can get the next slide. I'm having some problems changing slides. Uh, now it's now I think now it's working. So uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients, um, uh, as we know, uh, they are chemicals that have both. Uh, need to be both effective and safe. So either or is not sufficient. If it's only effective but not safe, then it's a poison. And if uh, it's only safe but not effective, uh, it doesn't really do, do anything. Uh, but there are also other uh, aspects when it comes to active pharmaceutical in ingredients, such as the ease of synthesis, uh, the uh, patentability, and so on. Um, but the but main, main point that we are addressing here is the bioactivity. And uh, it is a compound that is designed to have an effect on a biological organism. And many uh, drug targets are not found uh, not only in humans, but also in other organisms as well, uh, due to uh, their conservation in evolution. Um, we are dealing also with the issue of uh, the stability of the compound since they need to have long enough shelf life but that stability leads also to stability in the environment and especially uh, in the uh, uh, case of uh, an, uh, drugs affecting the central nervous system the relative lipophilicity and again in the environment uh, we have different types of exposure we have chronic or acute uh, biotransformation not only uh, in organisms but, but also due to environmental conditions uh, uh, such as photocatalysis by the sun. And we are dealing with uh, drug interactions here as well since uh, we might not have very high concentrations of any uh, compound but we might have uh, compounds that have interactions and thus lead to an effect in concentrations where the individual compounds would not. 
Um, some compounds is actually very lipophilic ones tend to concentrate in the food chain, as we all know uh, from uh, the uh, DDC example. And we are dealing with a huge chemical space here, so around 3,000 molecules plus other ingredients. And why this kind of research has been possible or become possible within the next uh, uh, within the uh, last 15, 20 years or so is that the analytical sensitivity has reached such level that this kind of research can be done. Mm. So where do these Again, I would like the next slide, please. Um, so where do these uh, APIs come from? Uh, various sources, uh, consumers uh, using, uh, or patients using uh, medicine, pharmaceutical industry, also drug use in hospitals, and uh, veter veterinary use. And after they uh, enter the water, uh, we'll discuss the more, uh, exact weights uh, in the following slides. They enter the wastewater treatment plant and unfortunately not everything can be removed there. And afterwards they end up water bodies, whether it be uh, drinking water in very rare cases, surface water or groundwater, and or agricultural soils. Again, next one please. Mm. Now the, uh, this diagram is nice because the uh, thickness of arrows uh, shows the relative significance uh, of uh, this uh, yeah, flow of APIs to the environment. So as you see, uh, the thickest arrows is from uh, the uh, pharmaceutical industry to prescription uh, to uh, the uh, toilet seat and to the wastewater treatment plant. So majority of exposure of uh, pharmaceuticals in the environment comes from proper use of medicines. They are uh, manufactured, uh, prescribed uh, or bought over the counter, consumed by patients, metabolized, excreted, and then they pass on to the, to the water. Well, slightly narrower arrows, arrows come from the uh, pharma industry directly, or the drug manufacturing directly to the environment and also due to medicine way. And this very thin arrow uh, from this water body to this glass of drinking water describes the uh, very rare cases of uh, pharmaceutical residues entering drinking water. And in the second, uh, second slide, this uh, shows more or less the same uh, with the different um, uh, in a different way, highlighting also the role of veterinary use of, of pharmaceuticals. Okay. Next one, please. Uh, so uh, we are dealing with not only uh, uh, these APIs, but biologically active transformation products of, of them and of uh, additives. And this list of problematic APIs is by no means comprehensive. Uh, but these are the types of uh, compounds that most typically cause problems uh, problems in in the environment. And next one, please. And here uh, is some, some uh, repetition, uh, perhaps uh, for all, all of you. But we have uh, not only uh, we have to analytically uh, monitor the concentration of the uh, API, but also all its major metabolites, uh, which uh, as we all know, can uh, there can be a huge variability uh, between them. And uh, although uh, this, uh, this can be modeled uh, with, a, with a computers, this metabolism can to some extent be modeled. So in the end, we uh, always have to go to the lab and see what kind of metabolites uh, appear from which uh, which API. Um, so we need uh, the next example. The next slide shows uh, why we need to take into account the biotransformation of uh, uh, compounds in this kind of research. So here you see the um, metabolism of carbamazepine. and in this uh, bar diagram you see the concentration of carbamazepine and um, 
uh, these black uh, bars show uh, the concentrations on, of carbamazepine in the influence of the water that enters the uh, wastewater treatment plant, and the gray bars show the, in, in the effluent, so the uh, supposedly pure water that is exiting the wastewater treatment plant. Then this would uh, suggest that somehow carbamazepine is magically appearing during the wastewater treatment process. But this is uh, due to metabolism. So uh, one of the metabolites is glucuronide of carbamazepine. Uh, and in this wastewater treatment plant, this glucuronide moiety is cleaved from the API, carbamazepine. And thus, uh, it, it gives the impression that the carbamazepine concentrations are increasing. So this is one example why we need to take into account the metabolism in this kind of work. Mm. And the next slide we will skip, and uh, this one we skip, and uh, this one as well. And suffice to say that not all active pharmaceuticals can be removed uh, by uh, by wastewater treatment, or rather they can be, but tackling all of them is extremely uh, difficult and also expensive. And why is that? Since we have a huge chemical space covered by uh, active pharmaceutical in, uh, ingredients. So here you have some privileged scaffolds, so uh, chemical structures that are uh, typically uh, found in active pharmaceutical ingredients. So, it, and especially the microbio uh, micro, uh, microbiological processes used in wastewater treatment, they can be rather specific to one compound or one group of compounds. And if we want to cover everything, so we need to uh, really uh, do a lot of work. Mm, and now, uh, this map shows uh, where uh, these active pharmaceuticals have been detected in surface water, groundwater, and so on. And this map mostly reflects uh, that's where this type of research is uh, conducted. Uh, it can be uh, expected that, uh, that also the gray areas uh, uh, are, are certain to contain uh, some pharmaceuticals in the water bodies as well. Uh, but uh, remarkably, they have been detected in water bodies on every continent. And next. Um, uh, this list, to some extent, uh, uh, covers the uh, previous list of uh, problematic compounds. Uh, they, there are uh, hormones, uh, antibiotics, uh, and then some, uh, then some particularly stable or problematic compounds such as carbamazepine and, uh, and some compounds that are on this list due to their, uh, that they have, are used so widely, such as ibuprofen or diclofenac. Mm. So what happens to the APIs uh, when they uh, enter, uh, enter the environment? Uh, those that can uh, be degraded will be degraded uh, uh, either to active or inactive product. Um, stable hydrophilic molecules uh, accumulate in water, possibly in groundwater, and stable hydrophobic molecules uh, are absorbed to the sludge used in the wastewater treatment. Um, and if uh, such uh, residues are present in this sludge, and the sludge is recycled to be used uh, uh, as a fertilizer, yeah, they, they can end up uh, in uh, potentially in crops as well, as shown by the example on the right. So this is a, a, a simulation uh, done by irrigating uh, carrots uh, with the water that contains uh, concentrations uh, of compounds on, on same levels as in those uh, waters exiting the waste for the treatment plant. And it was shown that uh, therapeutically active uh, doses of compounds could accumulate in uh, in the crops. So, so just to uh, emphasize that the, uh, uh, although this is simulation, that the, uh, there is potential for uh, for exposure uh, to humans or animals as well. Mm, now, uh, also, it might come across some um, issues in research. A couple of years ago. Um, a group report, reported 
that they had discovered tramadol, an opioid thought, thought to be synthetic in, in, in African medicinal plants. But in a follow-up study, it was found that uh, not only this opioid uh, w uh, was discovered, but also uh, its metabolites produced by, by mammals. So this huge news of this uh, synthetic opioid being a, uh, a natural product were sort of debunked. Since, uh, moreover, this uh, tramadol in this plant was uh, detected only in those areas where uh, tramadol was used for farmers and um, uh, cattle as well. And next one, please. So what uh, might API do in the environment? This is a, a, a sort of a, a collection of examples of which not all I have time to go through, but in all of them, the main problem is the biological activity of the API. And of this, um, uh, I will uh, go through in more detail some of these. Next, please. Mm, uh, first, as promised, the focus is on antimicrobial uh, uh, resistance. So, majority of the uh, active pharmaceutical in, uh, ingredients are manufactured in China and India. Uh, a lot of waste is produ produced, most of which with which is in solution. Uh, cleaning the wastewater uh, is costly, but perhaps not as costly uh, as one would think. So one kilogram, uh, as mentioned in the last bullet point, uh, is a lot of active substance, regardless of the, of the active substance. Mm. And how this pharmaceutical pollution can then cause antimicrobial resistance. So if there are uh, con uh, active concentrations of antibiotics in the environment, it can co cause some selection pressure in the evolution that favors those uh, strains or populations of microbes that have the resistance gene towards that specific antibiotic. Uh, now, the, uh, in, in the environment, uh, there is uh, always a lot of uh, antibiotic resistance genes going around because they um, are a way of uh, evolutionary compete competition between microbial populations. Uh, and also, uh, as antibiotics are produced by uh, bacteria, so they are a, a method of evolutionary competition. And most of these bacterial populations are non-pathogenic, but the higher the number or the higher the amount of uh, resistance genes in the environment, the higher the probability that the, uh, this uh, population of bacteria can transfer this resistance gene to some other bacterium that might be pathogenic. So that's why also all the resistant populations in the environment are a cause to worry. Mm. In, uh, this example was now due to uh, uh, residues from pharma industry, but uh, uh, the improper use of pharmaceuticals it can also uh, do that in the same way. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, most of the uh, API manufacturing is in China and India, and uh, it's not sort of uh, very fair that the Western world has uh, if you will outsource the problem of resistance bacteria to these countries. Um, but but uh, and since uh, we live in a global world and global problems require global solutions, and the problem can, can come surprisingly close to also those countries in which it, ha it has not been de detected, emphasized by this study, uh, uh, at the low bottom end of the screen, so resistance bacteria were found to migrate among mi migratory birds. So the problem uh, can travel surprisingly quickly. Um, besides this being unfair, of course. Now it appears that I have t some time to go through some of these examples. So uh, uh, hormones, hormone residues. Uh, have been found to affect uh, the uh, sex of the fish. So in, in uh, water bodies where there are high 
uh, concentration of um, contraceptive residues, the uh, balance of sexes uh, in the fish population have uh, have been, been it has gone wrong. So this uh, figure shows the uh, microscopic uh, uh, appearance of oocytes, female, female organs in in, te uh, in testicular intestines of male fish. And the next one, please. Uh, near the wastewater management uses uh, units, nearly uh, uh, up to 100% of roaches could express uh, is express uh, intersexuality. So this really uh, small concentration can have a huge effect on fish. Now these effects uh, have luckily remained rather local, and um, it, but potentially they can. Uh, affect the population or the survivability of fish population. And next one, please. And not only contraceptives can uh, induce these kinds of problems, but other compounds too, such as uh, metformin or other hormone de uh, disruptors, endocrine disruptors, for, uh, for example, plasticizers. Um, also, uh, uh, small concentrations of uh, pharmaceuticals uh, here is cyclophenac, ibuprofen, and propranolol. They can uh, affect muscles. This has done, been done in uh, Baltic Sea blue muscles, and you see those strings that are uh, using that the muscle is using to attach to the rock. So they are weaker, and there's a fewer fewer of them. Uh, in uh, muscles exposed to pharmaceutical residues. Next one, please. Uh, this one we'll skip, I think, uh, as well as this one. They, uh, they can be accessed later. But here, since this is uh, the most famous example, this diclofenac, um, and then we'll, we'll go, go through this. So um, in, this, in this classic example, uh, in India, uh, on, in some areas, diclofenac was given to the cattle. And one, once these carcasses, uh, some of them remained in the environment and they were eaten by vultures. But these vultures are extremely sensitive to diclofenac, so um, it uh, induces the accumulation of urate uh, to vulture plasma and leads to kin uh, kidney failure. And uh, Populations of vultures collapsed uh, in ver various uh, places, but action was taken, giving diclofenac to the cattle was uh, stopped, and uh, the, these vulture populations luckily uh, have since recovered. Now, uh, now we'll discuss the measuring the ecotoxicity. Uh, the rest of the examples uh, are. Uh, are, are in the slides, uh, which I think will, will be available if, if I'm not completely wrong. So ecotoxicity. In the States, it has been part of the dossier of new drugs since 1980s, and the European Union uh, published its guideline on the environmental risk assessment of medicinal products for human use in 1996 and updated it in 2012. Um, um, but these, these dossiers uh, concern only uh, drugs that have entered the market since the publication of these. Uh, so everything that has entered the market before that remains largely unstudied. Now in Europe there is this REACH, uh, which covers all chemicals, but not pharmaceuticals. So pharmaceuticals are re regulated in a, uh, uh, differently. And, uh, uh, notably, also in the, according to this European Union guideline, a marketing authorization uh, is not uh, uh, or cannot be it, uh, cannot be uh, rejected due to environmental effects or risks of the drug. Rather, these studies that this guideline requires are uh, a way to acquire information on how uh, how to handle the risks better. Um, and about this uh, environmental classification, Eva will be talking more, but this uh, 
uh, they have guidance for pharmaceutical companies in Sweden and Norway. And the next slide shows a very crude measure of uh, this evaluation. So for APIs, we have predicted no effect concentration and predicted environmental concentration to uh, that are determined in the lab. And these numbers uh, are compared and their ratio shows uh, the size of the risk. But note that these both are predicted. So we have two predicted values, so even more uncertainty in the final value. And also the uh, amount of usage uh, locally uh, affects this. And for, this is for active pharmaceutical ingredients. For drug products or comparing different products, we have no existing system. So this ends my part, and now I'll give the mic to Eva. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you very much, um, Jaco. I will continue from here. Uh, Jaco, I, I, will, I will just uh, briefly introduce you, Eva, um, and then I'll give you the floor. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Ms. Eva Tedesalmi is Vice President of FIP. She graduated from the Helsinki University as Masters of Pharmacy in 1982, and her interests have always been in the field of managing change of the pharmacy profession from the traditional, more dispensing focused role to a public health supporter role. For this, the continuing education and service development and research on managing change have been her main interest areas in her professional life. This has happened at the local, national and international level where pharmacists' roles in promotion on public health has been defined. Emma, Eva has also been very much involved in FIP in the entire production of publications and policy related to the environmental impact of pharmaceuticals and of the pharma of pharmacy practice itself, from the production of the reference paper in 2015 and the policy statement in 2016. Eva was always there, so she's quite an expert and, and also a long-time uh, advocate for these issues within FIP. So thank you very much, Eva, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Gunther, and a good afternoon from my part. Uh, nice to be here in this seminar and webinar to, to, and, and have the possibility to talk with all of you. And uh, we will now start uh, with the next slide. Looking at this uh, problem, uh, guidance for practitioners. So this is a global problem as we have learned from Jaco's presentation. So what is needed are also global solutions. And they, uh, this has also happened. The United Nations started their own environment program already in 1972. And it has been a grown since that to a, to a big uh, uh, programs to how, to how to manage the problem. And they, we can also see that in the sustainable development goals on which the uh, UN now is basing their activities, there are uh, issues which are very closely related to, to the environmental issues and, and pharmaceuticals also. And a, there is also an ongoing discussion just now to should we add the, the AMR as an indicator uh, to, to uh, show how we are reaching the sustainable development goals. So let's see what will happen with this, this issue. And a, if we look at the, uh, what is done in the WHO, uh, there is a program called Green Procurement in healthcare sector. And a, we know that the UN is a very big a buyer of the, of the medicines in the global market. And for that, uh, they have also understood that they need to have some guidance for their internal usage. And uh, if we look at this, uh, uh, what, uh, where these uh, uh, green procurement uh, issues are, are especially mentioned, so we can take up here uh, the, uh, during man-made and natural catastrophe. So about the drug donations and disposal problems, there are statements accepted by, the, by WHO. And I, I really want to take up here in this connection the, the issue that they, it seems to be a good idea to send medicines say, a, a, to, to the countries suffering from the from catastrophe, different kind of catastrophe. But in fact, uh, it's never a very good idea to send a collection of medicines, which the people don't know how to use them, what they are for something, etc. 
because then they only end up in a, in a high piles of, uh, of uh, disposal waste um, uh, things and they they are more uh, co co causing harm to the to these uh, countries which are getting them instead of you doing any of the of the, of the using what the donators were thinking about so whenever you want to be a, a acting in this field please contact the country and ask what they do need and send those things never never send what you want to get rid of so the the next point uh, which is already mentioned here in uh, is is about this stockholm county council environmental classification of pharmaceuticals and uh, we are going to talk about a little more about this in the next slide. And uh, then the third thing is the Viennese database for the, um, uh, this is a uh, to assist the hospitals and other healthcare settings to assess the effectiveness, safety, and environmental factors when producing procuring disinfectants. So these are tr just three different examples about what has been a uh, thought in a in a field of procurement what kind of things we should uh, take into the consideration when we are talking about the environmental effects. And uh, then about these classification systems with a Jaco already mentioned, uh, they are based on the APIS risk to the environmental uh, together with the consumption. Could I get the next slide, please? And they, um, so this system has been uh, originally developed in, in, in Sweden and it's now spread also to Norway and we are looking at this possibility to have this in, in, uh, in Finland. But they, uh, it's based on the, on the APIS risk to environment and then based on the, on the figure how much it's used. And in fact, it's a little bit problematic that it doesn't give any, any more information about the, 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 the life cycle of this specific uh, um, product. Not only, uh, it's, it's only giving some information about the API. But they, we definitely need this kind of a classification system if we want to inform customers about the, the environmental effects of the, of the, of the medical products. If you want to, we want to influence the purchasing process and influence the tenders, because if the um, if the in, in tenders we would like to include some principles about the environmental uh, effects of the of the products, then we should know more about their their real life cycle. And also, in if we think about the pricing mechanisms, now in in many countries we have this reference price systems, together with the with the generic substitution. And the, and the only factor what is looked is that they, how uh, cheap is the product. But these environmental costs are not included in this price because they, it's not uh, covered by, by GMP. And this means that if we would like to have some effect on these pricing mechanisms, we should know more about the life cycle on the, on the product. So what we would like to see in the future is a, more effective classification system, which is not only based on the on the API risk, but but also on the on the life cycle of the product. And as, as Jaco already mentioned, the the problem is also that there is only the risk uh, environmental risk analysis for the new molecules. But there are about two thousand APIs in the market which are unclassified. So there is a huge job. Uh, for for pharmacists in their laboratories to 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 do these classifications and and to include it into the regulation so that it should be uh, part of the of the dossiers even in the in the national level. Uh, so if we look at the uh, then from this uh, global level we go to the EU level, and I've chosen this EU level because uh, there is a strategic approach to pharmaceuticals in the environment which has been accepted in 2019, which is presented in this next slide. And they, this covers both human and veterinary medicines and from production to waste. So it's quite a, a good program to, to cover the, the whole problem. And they, they, uh, in, in EU, uh, it has been found out, which is evident, that the most important thing is to raise awareness and promote prudent use of medicines. 
because uh, the most of the APIs which enter into the to the wastewater management and after that to the to the waters are produced by the by the uh, prudent use and they by the by the necessary use of medicines it's not just the 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 uh, overlap so to say but it's it's exactly the, the the medicines which should be used and are used in the right way so uh, what we can do here is to to understand the mechanisms of a of how to how to uh, promote the, the, the really the the right usage of the medicines to avoid any kind of wasting we also should improve training and risk assessment and a uh, training of the risk assessment and training of the of the understanding of this classification system we also lack a lot of of a uh, monitoring data so as Jaco showed you in those a uh, analysis where the apis are detected so the gray areas were not places where the apis possibly are are existing are not existing but places where there is no monitoring going on so a huge lack of data in, in these discussions. Also, the green design of molecules, which I will talk a little bit more later, is important. And they, then uh, the, the reducing the emissions from manufacturing. And this is also the uh, part of the, of the discussion about where these uh, uh, emissions are, are let out. Because, uh, as you know, most of the apis are produced in, in Asia, in China and in India. And they, uh, unfortunately, the GMP doesn't cover any of these say, uh, wastewater or emission uh, issues. But what happens outside the, the factory, it could be a, a, a beautiful uh, manufacturing plant uh, fulfilling all the requirements of GMP, but uh, not... Uh, having any any uh, regulation what it should follow concerning the wastewater management and this is a huge discussion going on also in WHO that should we include to the uh, GMP a um, you know, wastewater management part so that we could help for example the, the AMR uh, problem we also need to reduce waste and they, uh, we, what we also need to do is to improve the wastewater management treatment. And they, we know that they, the wastewater can be uh, totally released from the, from the uh, apis, but this means that the, you have to use this osmosis technology, which is quite uh, expensive. And the question is that they, that they how to balance these, uh, these things. Should we use it on, on site, a, a treatment or something else? And as we already have uh, discussed, this, this antimicrobial uh, resistance problem. So in the EU, there is this European One Health Action, which uh, discusses especially the, the, the problem of, of uh, AMR. Um, then if we focus more on the, on the um, FIP level, uh, I will... Uh, introduce you this a document green pharmacy practice taking responsibility for the environmental impact of medicines which a gonzo already mentioned so um, first time when when i remember fip has a really tackled this this a green uh, environmental issue was already in, in in 2009 when the when the uh, good pharmacy practice document came out so there in this famous document, we have in the uh, when we look at the different roles what the pharmacists have. So the first role is to prepare, obtain, store, secure, distribute, administer, dispense, and dispose of medical products. So already then, they say uh, function E, dispensing of medical products, and the, the function if dispose of medicine preparations and medicinal products has been discussed. And we have understood that there should be some national standards of the role of the pharmacist in this uh, disposal issue. Uh, in this uh, uh, document on, on a green pharmacy practice and on the statement based on this uh, reference document, a uh, different kind of a, um, this, this problem of the environmental pollution of, of apis is, is discussed and the, and the mechanisms are, are described. 
but it also gives a, a different a, um, ideas what pharmacists in their different uh, settings can, can do to tackle the problem. And if we look at those, so uh, we can see in the next slide, uh, I have make the asterisk for this, say three different or four different uh, areas of activity. So the first two ones, Concern the, the people who are working in the in the research and and development phase of the of the new the new uh, pharmaceutical active ingredients. So in the drug de development and research, there are these uh, famous principles of green chemistry, and a people developing the the new molecules uh, should look at the possibilities to to follow these these principles as as far as possible. So to find whether these active uh, active parts of the molecules could be um, placed with the with the others which are as active as these uh, already existing ones, but not so harmful to the environment. Uh, the the next point is is about the industry, and a, as a, I already mentioned, the there should be as small emissions as possible, and the processes should also be as effective as as possible. And they, this is, of course, a from the even from the economical point of view, uh, a, a, a good point for the for the medical industry. So I don't see any reason why why every um, industrial plant should should they try to to do anything else but to but to, but, but uh, make them processes as effective as possible. And then this classification of medicines, the information is of course owned by the industry. And they are the only ones who are able to to produce the the real a, a documentation about in their dossier about this for this classification. So um, a good collaboration with medical industry is needed to solve these these problems. And as I already mentioned, the role of the GMP is crucial in the here. There might be other ways how to to implement the the national a a environmental legislation to the to the medical industries but they if you want to have a, a, a global effect then GMP is is quite effective way to do that if we then look at the the, the other actors we have the wholesalers so for them of course it's to secure the the um, that we don't have any any qualifications in the market the logistics should be as effective as, as possible and the procurement process uh, very reliable. Uh, in hospital pharmacies, the pharmacists are part of the drug committee's work and they are doing the procurement. And they, uh, there is also a huge need for, for to educate the other actors in the hospitals. Uh, and in hospitals also, we can see the importance of the collection of waste at point and they, this means that they, if we think about the, the wastewater, when it comes to the, to the plant where it's a, uh, treated, it's already uh, diluted in a, in a thousand, uh, thousand times. And it's much more effective to, to, um, to, to work with it in, in the point of where it is produced. And especially if we think about the chemotherapeuts, or, a, or the hormones, so it could be better to, to have them already reduced from the medical, uh, from the wastewater on the spot. This means on the, on the wards. Uh, and I have also already mentioned here the, the uh, risk management of own actions. I will come back to this point, but, but in every office, wherever you are working, you should also look at your own, own environmental actions and see what you can do for those. Uh, in the open care pharmacy, the most important thing, as I already mentioned, the the the, the problem is caused mainly by the right usage of the of the medicines, not from the wrong usage or the wasting of the medicines. So, uh, the the most important thing you can do in a normal open care pharmacy is to to increase the uh, adherence to medical therapies, so that the medicines are used in the way they should. And they don't end in end into the wrong places with the wrong uh, wrong uh, actions. So, so you have to inform your customers 
about the medical waste and you have to uh, also do the risk management of your own actions. If we then think the role of the regulators, uh, there we come back to this classification of medicines because we need some regulation about the, how to classify and, and where these classifications should be used then. Uh, for example, on the drug prices, so that our reference price systems should say also include this say, uh, reference price system. And a, um, the fourth uh, issue are the, are the pharmacy educators. So the future pharmacists should be aware of the problem and of the solutions. So we should include include the the the, um, the problem solution and and the education in our curriculums. Uh, then, if we look a little bit closer to these uh, things I already mentioned, so this is the Benning by design, the green chemistry and green formulations. So both of uh, things are important. So you see here the active a, 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 a parts of the molecules. What can we use? How can we uh, how can we, uh, uh, transform uh, or, or uh, change the use in a way that they that they are not uh, harmful to the to the environment? And on the on the uh, second uh, picture, you can also see the. Uh, you can design the, the 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 formula, not only the the molecule, but the formula. How is it uh, given to the people, and how how it, it could be make more effective in the in the. So for our pharmaceutical chemistry uh, people, there is a lot to do in in a, in this, uh, and also for the pharmacy technologists. Then if we look at this rational medicine usage, which is a, uh, presented in the next slide. So um, as I, I now mentioned several times, so the rational prescribing and the rational drug usage are the main factors to prevent the problem because the, the cost of this a uh, drug waste a, uh, is, is a really uh, huge because we know from the WHO research that for the long-term therapies only one-third successes as planned which means that two-thirds are, are not as successful as they should be which means that the that they more or less this say part of the, of the therapy is going uh, in waste and in Finland we have counted that the cost of the medical waste is a about 100 million euros per year and if you can uh, understand that they that we could with our work in the community pharmacies and in in the hospital pharmacies uh, in in preventing or promoting the rational prescribing and usage could prevent this problem to 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 occur. It could really solve uh, uh, save us a, a huge amount of money globally. And a consumer should be informed about the impact of medical waste because they normally don't know anything about this issue and they they are uh, it's difficult to to get them to uh, to understand that that every one of them can can uh, affect this issue so we need some legislative actions about the waste management and they we also need the classification of medical waste as hazardous waste so far the medical waste is seen only as the normal waste we we, we cannot say uh, see any any uh, uh, or, or we don't have this day uh, this day uh, necessary actions uh, unfortunately only the incineration in 930 uh, celsius centigrade or over is the only way to dispose the medical waste safely so uh, you cannot burn it in your background or, or something else it's it has to be incinerated in specific uh, plants so every country needs these, say, incineration plants to, to manage with the problem. And also these take-up programs should be organized. And they, in many countries, pharmacies are running these take-back programs, but they're not on their own cost. That couldn't uh, solve the problem, but it has to be in the national legislation organized. And then the pharmacies could collaborate with this and also with the, with the informing and, and the, uh, the customers about these take-back programs. And in hospitals, the, the, the treatment on the spot work is, is of essential importance. So I encourage all of you, 
colleagues in the in the hospitals and in the pharmacies to to uh, continue your work in, in, in these issues. And in the next uh, slide, I have tried to connect uh, uh, this idea of the effective wastewater management and treatment at the source to this actual uh, COVID problem. Uh, this is a, a, a slide from China, where they have understood that they cannot really, in the municipal sewage treatment plant, uh, uh, help uh, the COVID virus to spread. But it has to be done in the in the hospital, in the quarantine center, and in the residential areas already, so that they say um, this uh, must be uh, um, on the spot, so to say. So very far, uh, very fast, uh, the Chinese uh, officials understood that they that this, if we want to get rid of the COVID viruses and the, which are in the feces and urine. Uh, so the medical waste water must be treated on the spot, and they, this goes also for all the other uh, issues and the, and the APIs, so that we understand why why the uh, treatment at the source is so important. Uh, and they, not only these activities, but in the next slide, I have uh, uh, shown an example about how can you. Um, do a risk analysis in your own uh, working place so that they you know that they which activities are the most uh, effective in your own uh, environment so this is for uh, from a from a pharmacy where you have made a risk analysis about your your different processes and they um, so and you can see from from this slide on the um, on the column, which is a uh, the next one from from the bottom, customers return of unused and expired medicines three uh, pluses uh, that the um, that if we want to um, really um, get this say number or they say amount of these medicines uh, given back to the pharmacies as small as possible, so it is to improve medication compliance so that all the medicines dispensed are actually used by the consumer and they also participating in the medical waste collection programs is essential so um, and they uh, with this risk analysis uh, this this goes to the quality management of, the, of this problem so it's also important that then you then when you have made the risk analysis you have take, taken the actions to to a which are the most effective in your case so you also measure uh, how successful your actions are and with this you can m uh, measure the amount of waste collected to the pharmacy with your take-up program or if you want to um, really concentrate on your own environment how much electricity did you use and they how much paper you cons consume in your pharmacy etc etc so a uh, all these say different actions can be uh, analyzed in, in your different uh, working environments, and you can use this knowledge for your for the uh, to to tackle the, the problem. You can even uh, have a, a certificate for your environmental uh, program if you are uh, really interested on this issue. There are two kind of of a certificates. The other one are for the offices, green offices, and the other one is for this say. Uh, uh, environmental activities in in total. The the last thing I want to mention here is the the pharmaceutical education. So this is the what the educators can do. It is very important that the future pharmacists should be aware of the sustainable solutions and sustainable practice. And for this reason, uh, this topic should be included and integrated on all pharmacy curriculums. And they, we've started this work in the Helsinki University with a program called Generation Green. If you are interested to give a, have more knowledge about this, say, uh, this program, we have just published a, an article about the, uh, which is called a holistic approach to implementation of green principles and practices in education programs in pharmaceutical and medical sciences at the University of Helsinki. And this can be found in the Sustainable Chemical Pharmacy, uh, number 16. 
So I, I, I welcome you to look at this if you want to get more ideas about how to, how to uh, start the work in your own, own uh, environment, which in this case is academic. So I hope with this uh, you have got some kind of ideas what you can do in your own working environment. And uh, with this, I give you the, the word back to Dubonso. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think these were two eye-opening presentations and very comprehensive. So thank you very much to Jaco and Eva for, uh, for sharing your expertise and these, and these uh, notions with us. Um, we will now have some time for questions, but before we move on to the questions, uh, I think that we would like to run the, the, the questions we had at the beginning again, just to for you to, to also to share with us whether the, the knowledge and, and the presentations that we've just witnessed and shared with us uh, had an impact on your awareness uh, of these problems and the solutions that you can contribute with. So the first question is whether you are familiar with the problems that uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients can cause uh, to the environment from the scale from one to five. Very well. And so the result is that um, 35% of um, attendees voted for uh, number, four, number four. So they have a relatively high level of knowledge and 22% and for number five. So an excellent knowledge of these problems. So a, a vast majority uh, either vo voted for four, five, or 27% also voted for uh, number three. Thank you. In the meantime, you can think of some questions that you may want to ask using the Q&A box, please. And the second question is, uh, I know how the APIs enter into the environment. So your, your awareness, your knowledge about how these molecules make their way into the ecosystem from one totally uh, unaware uh, or to five, you have a very excellent knowledge about this uh, issue. Thank you. So here we see that the majority of uh, participants voted uh, for number three. So they have an, an average level of knowledge of how these molecules make their way into the environment. Um, and then uh, we had 30% uh, for number four and 24% for number five. So there is a relatively good uh, level of knowledge. And I think that this, this excellent webinar uh, with the two presentations contributed to, to improving this awareness. And the third question. I know what I can do in my professional role as a pharmacist to contribute to the solutions to this uh, big, important challenge. So from one to five, how do you classify your awareness and your, uh, about what you can do from your own practice? From one, being totally uh, unaware of how you can contribute to five, you're, you have an excellent knowledge or you're fully aware of how you can contribute to this. Thank you very much. So we also see that uh, the webinar had an impact in terms of um, the level of awareness of how uh, pharmacists around the world can, can contribute to this problem uh, from their own practice. So a majority of colleagues uh, answered number four with 38%, but also number three uh, with 31% and five with an excellent knowledge, 24%. So definitely we are on the positive uh, path, let's say, because um, few colleagues uh, indicated that their awareness of their role in, in this problem is, is uh, lower, let's say. So just now uh, addressing some questions, um, and maybe the first one for uh, Eva. Um, 
if there isn't a general or a, a nationwide or a country system for collecting waste of pharmaceuticals through community pharmacists, pharmacies, what can community pharmacies do to offer a solution to this problem? It is very difficult if you don't have any national framework for this issue. Uh, but I think the, then it's even more important that you that you are taking care that there will there will be no need for take take up program so that that you really look at that that every medicine which is say dispensed that the person also knows why is it dispensed and is able to use it so that we 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 have as as little waste as as possible but they. I, I really think that this is a work for the National Association of Pharmacists to bring this into the general knowledge, what are the effects of the, of the medical waste with, if it enters into the nature untreated and that, they, that there is a need for, for, a, for a national uh, a program on this issue. Because a, we know that the health hazards of the, of the untreated medicines in the environment are, are really huge ones and I think we can use as an example, for example, this vulture uh, example. Yes, actually, I'm reading through the various questions that we received, and several of them have have to do with this same issue. So, with uh, with uh, colleagues that come from countries that either do not have such uh, take back programs, or uh, there is no coordination from across different provinces or parts of the country, for example. Um, and some people are asking, how can we actually um, raise the awareness of government or um, pharmacy organizations and provincial or federal level governance uh, on how to, for developing this type of programs for take back, uh, taking back uh, un unused medicines? Yeah, I think this raising awareness is the key words here. So you, you really, as say, because you are now the ones who, who understand the problem, is to raise awareness of your governments who do not understand the problem. And they, uh, because this is not an, a controversial issue with the, with the economic benefits, but they, as, as we have learned, for example, for the AMR, and now we are suffering from the COVID. So all these kind of a, uh, problems, which we are not, untreatable. So uh, what, what the uh, problems they will cause to the mankind in the future. And they, uh, using the AMR as an example about the environmental unwanted effects of, of medicines, uh, I think it's, it's a relatively possible, not easy, but possible to raise the awareness of the, of the decision makers that, that we are in the, we are, this is a global problem, we are all in this boat, and if we want to have a, a, a treatment to our uh, infectious uh, diseases, we need also to solve this environmental problem. Thank you, Eva. Um, maybe now a question for Jaco. Um, the colleague is asking, how about extending the shelf life for uh, medicines, um, especially for medicines that are known to be in shortages? So this is sort of uh, a question that has uh, some pharmaceutical chemistry, let's say, or pharmaceutical technology uh, and side, but also a practice side to it. So maybe, maybe Jaco, you can um, address it from, from your perspective? Yeah, sure. So, um, of course, the shelf life is uh, important for all, all medicines, especially to those uh, that are essentially required. So, but the, um, besides pharmaceutical, uh, besides the chemistry of the compound, there are also other ways to achieve better shelf life, such as formulation technology and, and packaging, for example. And on the other hand, as shown by uh, Eva, these examples of um, sort of benign by design compounds that are both effective and can be degraded in the environment. So I see no reason why uh, it would be uh, impossible to design compounds that are not degraded, that are degraded may maybe by some specific process in the environment, but not uh, in the packaging, for example. Yeah, thank you. But that is that is uh, absolutely an important important issue to be discussed. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Um, Eva, we have a, a question that asks, would better information about the environmental impact influence consumer or patient behavior? Yes, it definitely does. And they, uh, just because the normal people do not understand at all the scale of this problem, not the economical scale, not the environmental scale. So uh, we've done here in, in my pharmacy a program called that now you can influence. And they, when we go to speak to people uh, like in the senior clubs or to the schools or something like that, so we try to explain to them that they, why you need to be adherent to your therapy. And there are three things you can do and, and, or why you need to do this. And the first one is poor economically. You can spend, uh, spare in your own costs if you do the, use the medicine in the way it should be used. And secondly, you spare a lot of in the, in the general costs if the medicine is not uh, ended up to the medical waste. And then if you ask the people, have you any idea how much the medical waste costs? They say that, well, about 1,000 euros in the year or something like that. And then when you put on the table this 100 million euros per year, they become shocked. And they immediately understand that, that they can influence. So, yes, this is the, the, the answer. <laughs> Yes, and I, and I would imagine the same applies to prescribers as well. So it's not yes. only a matter of cost-effective cost analysis, but maybe if some information on the impact of, of uh, their prescribing decisions on the environment can have, maybe that, that can influence the, the choice of uh, treatment for a patient, for example. Yeah, that's also the idea behind these classification systems. Of course, yeah. That you can choose a product which is, say, uh, if you have different, let's say, uh, antibiotics so you can choose the one which is less harmful from the from the environmental point of view but as effective from the treatment point of view because the whole idea is not to to a of course to to block any any necessary treatment but to use it wise be be wise in your your usage i can also tell you an example about the the finnish politics because we could really get into the uh, in the uh, program of the government, this issue of this 100 million euros, so they could understand that instead of changing the pharmacy system and sparing 100 million, which was a, a, an imaginary uh, number, but with this rational, so the, the program of rational therapy came into the program because they understood that in this way you can spare the cost of the medical waste. So a real political influence. Yes, um, yeah, some of our questions also point to the fact, of course, that in, in developing nations, this could be uh, a real challenge. And, um, for example, a colleague asks, how can this be applied in a rural setting, especially mm. in developing countries? I, personally, I think that in the same way than in, in, a, in the other settings, because the rural areas are not different in their... In, uh, they, they, there must be a, a take back program where they say waste is collected into the pharmacies or into the places where it is collected and they then, then a, uh, incinerated in the, in the right temperature. So I, I don't think in, in rural areas you cannot have just a, it's, it's not in your backyard, I mean the rural areas. It's not the backyard where you can put all the medical waste and then hope that it vanishes somehow. Unfortunately, it doesn't do that. Exactly. Um, well, there are, there's also uh, questions and uh, a, even a proposal from a colleague from the UK. Uh, if anyone wants to discuss undergraduate pharmacy learning outcomes, in relation to the pharmaceutical impact of uh, uh, to the environmental impact of pharmaceuticals, I'd be willing to discuss. And there's an email address. Um, I understand that I'm able to share this because it's it's written here for to share with the colleagues who are interested in this. That's a dot m dot assels a s t l e s at h u d dot a c dot u k. So that's Alison Assels. Thank you very much for, for that contribution. Um, definitely there's need for collaboration and sharing best practices also in terms of pharmacy education about this and curriculum yep, design. 
there were actually other uh, suggestions of collaboration as well, and we do have some undergraduate teaching on the topic in the University of Helsinki. So in, uh, I typed the answer, including my email address, uh, uh, to these, uh, now in these answered questions. So, so uh, feel, feel free to uh, email me on the collaboration as well. I will be returning to work in August. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jaco. Um, I okay, really then. hope that the FIP could put, set up a, a forum for environmental issues so that we could there collaborate with all these people, whether they are educators or, or researchers or whatever. So a, a, we, could, uh, we could go on with this a, a idea. Absolutely, yeah. And of course, if AMR is part of that discussion, then it's, it's such a relevant forum and a relevant project. Yeah. Too. Okay, so thank you very much for uh, your both excellent presentations and for addressing these questions. Um, just to, uh, to wrap up, um, to make this difference, uh, it is important that pharmacists accept the professional responsibility. And of course, we have also addressed some of the challenges. It's, it's not only about individuals willingness to, to, to contribute to these, but also in terms of pharmacy organizations and governance. But it's, it's also important for us to take up individual professional responsibility for the entire medicines use process and for informing patients uh, and, and other colleagues to take um, in well-informed decisions in terms of the environmental impact of, of pharmaceuticals and the use of medicines so that we can all uh, contribute to mitigating the environmental risk of um, APIs uh, making their way to the ecosystem. This responsibility extends across the entire medicines use continuum from manufacturing, manufacturing and distribution to prescribing, dispensing, and pharmaceutical care, disposing, uh, disposal of unused medicines, and ultimately to the reduction in the discharge of metabolic waste into the environment. In all countries, regardless of their place of employment or practice, pharmacists should seek to change the medicines use process so as to minimize the adverse environmental effects of medicines and related activities. So thank you very much again. Uh, I will just share with you uh, some information about the two upcoming uh, webinars um, or digital events. One of them is tomorrow and it's part of our uh, series of events on uh, the role of pharmacists in COVID-19. Um, this one is tomorrow, uh, Key Considerations for Developing COVID-19 Treatments, Learning from the Past and Planning for the Future. And then also tomorrow at 12 o'clock we'll have our uh, new series of uh, interviews by the FIP CEO, Dr. Catherine Duggan, who tomorrow will be interviewing uh, the immediate past president of FIP, Dr. Carmen Peña. So uh, thank you very much for attending. Uh, you're welcome again to provide feedback to us by, by email and, and also immediately after this webinar you will see, uh, uh, you will receive sort of a, a pop-up window with uh, an evaluation questionnaire about the webinar itself. So we thank you for participating in that. Again, thank you and have a rest, good, uh, a rest, um, a good rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.